Love that tune. It's simple, it's, yes. yet it's uh, gratifying. Is a good word. Gratifying. Gratifying. Uh, comforting. Comforting. Yeah. And it signals the beginning of the steam room. Yes, yes, yes. The podcast that that features my, Charles Barkley. You know, this is bittersweet because this is our last steam room for a minute. For a little while. Well, yeah, we'll be back, but, uh, yeah, but we, we got a lot of stuff, a lot yeah, of work three that's going to get in the way. Yeah. And I tell people, nothing can screw up March Madness. I, you know, it is, to me, it's been an honor and a privilege to do it these last X amount of years. I think we are we at 10 yeah, it's like, I mean, one year we didn't have it. This is 12. Man. 12 years of the agreement, that long term. That's unbelievable. Yeah, yeah. And I tell people, if you like sports, come to the Final Four. Uh, other than the Olympics, it's the single greatest thing I've ever been a part of. That's Saturday at the Final Four. One of the great days on the sports calendar yes. every year. So uh, nothing can screw up March Madness. we got to start there, but... And we're gonna and we're gonna be talking to Jay Wright, by the way. Yes, uh, just a bit later here in the steam room. So we look forward to that as we dive I look into forward to uh, seeing March Jay. Madness. Uh, it's not like he's got anything else to do. He's unemployed. He's doing TV. Uh, okay, yep. that's that's now basically he's doing TV with us. That's unemployed. <laughs> <laughs> You're that's employed. Like, hey, he know Tom Brady, but he's a pretty man. Mm -hmm. okay. Well, I'll let you guys get into that when we uh, uh, okay. when we talk to Jay Wright in just a bit. But first of all, well, unfortunately. Uh, you know, I, the, the, the steam room was supposed to be a fun thing. We're supposed to and enter. And 85% of the time it is. Yes. Well, this is the 15%. Okay. Man, you, you know, Ernie, you like to say you didn't see this coming, but you saw this coming. Uh, we, we have talked about John Morant for the last three or four podcasts, and you, it, had to come, it had to come to this stupidity and ridiculousness, whatever words you want to use. I mean, man, this kid is so talented, so talented, a great player. And you see the first incident with one of his friends pulling a gun on fans. He gets banned. And we said, yo, man, you got to have better friends. You got to have better people around you. Then you see where he punches a kid and pulls a gun on a kid. Yeah, this stuff comes out from what what uh, allegedly happened this past summer. And then you see him in a nightclub. On IG Live. On his own IG Live, flashing a gun. And you just say to yourself, what the hell is up with this kid? And now you see he's, I don't know what words you want to use, suspended, time out. He's away from the team, going to be away from the I applaud the Memphis Grizzlies for not waiting on Adam Silver. I said, no, nah, you need to go right now. And at, and at first it was he'll miss the next two games, and now it's the next four minimum. Well, because this is just my personal opinion. What I think happened was, because I was actually talking to a friend, because he asked me, I says, well, I think Adam Silver is letting the Grizzlies handle it. And if they don't do something significant, he's probably going to have to step in. Because I, I, uh, to my recollection, I haven't heard Adam say anything. So I think he's like, okay, you guys handled it. Now y'all handling it. I'm going to stay out of it. Because I personally think Herm Edwards is one of my great people I've met in my life. Herm Edwards, if you get a chance, he always talk about don't push sin. But what he always talks about, he suspended some guys because he said, I'm not going to wait on the NFL. What you did was wrong. My job as a coach to teach you right from wrong. And I said, man, that's admirable. He's not worried about winning games. You know, he said, hey, I represent, because he's the, he's the first person, I, and I, this is one of the most important things I talk about when I speak to young kids. He says, this is my, he says, my name ain't Herm Edwards. He says, that's my family's name. He says, I represent my family. And I was like, wow, that's deep and strong. So he says, if you do anything to embarrass your family, my job as a coach is to penalize you. And I, I want to get back. I just want to applaud the Memphis Grizzlies, Coach Jenkins and whoever. Like, no, man, you need to sit down because it hurts me, man. It really hurts me as an NBA player. When one of my kids, because I look at all of them as my kids, do something stupid. 
And to win, to win, like he's winning at life. He just signed a five-year, $231 million deal that kicks in next year. He's winning. He's going to make $231 million. Bless him, bless him, bless him for dribbling a stupid basketball. All he got to do is don't be a damn fool and idiot. And he can't do that. Yo, man, I just want to say this. I wish you nothing but the best. I hope you get your crap together. I I, I just don't. You, you got to make your mind up. If you want to be a gangster, be a gangster. But we prefer if you be just a great basketball player. Uh, it just hurts me, Ernie, uh, to see one of my kids throw this on the verge of throwing this away. Because I was doing an interview with Roy Johnson, who's a friend of mine who works in Alabama, and he wrote a big article. D. Like, Roy Johnson? D. Roy Great Johnson. writer forever yes, and ever. Yeah. yeah. So he works. Great dude. He's in Alabama now, works for Alabama.com. And he called me to do a column on the John Moran thing. And I said, I said, you know, Roy, interesting, because you see what just happened in Alabama. I says, that's how quickly your life can change. One day this dude is playing basketball. He killed his girl. He's going to jail for the rest of his life. The rest of his life. That's how serious this thing is. With Like, John Morant has had three gun incident. One gun incident is too many. Three is way too many. But I was using that analogy about the young kid at Alabama. One minute, you're 18, 19 years old. You do something really stupid and kill a young lady. Your life is over. And that's the thing that Ja has to do. Like, yo, man, I can make five years, $231 million. Not the money is the most important thing. I can just play stupid basketball and make $231 million because I'm great at it. Or I could go out and I could kill somebody and spend the rest of my life in jail. And I just feel sadness, Ernie. I, I, I really do. Um, this is the third time we've talked about this, and it kept yeah. escalating, escalating, escalating. And I just don't understand it. No, and, and you're, the hope when I look at this thing, Chuckster, is this time away. And I don't know exactly what is entailed in trying to get him straight and get him get things figured out in his time away from the court. Um, but you'd, you would hope that it would just, it would be something as, look, I screwed up. I need to fix it. End of story. I'm not going to talk about, you know, because then you... You hear about, and I don't have to deal with the stress. And, and no, I don't, you know, I want to hear, you know, and what I think, with, what I think the public really appreciates is just an honest assessment of what happened. Look, I screwed up. I need to fix this. And I let my family, yeah, my friends, my I teammates. My, yeah. I, yeah. You represent your family. You represent your team. You represent yeah. your city. And, and if, and it may, hopefully he sees that there is that trickle down effect and you yes. know what i can't do this and so uh and i think what folks underestimate is the willingness of the fans and of the viewing public to pull for somebody who just comes out honestly and says you yes. know i need to I, I can be better than this yes. and i'm working to do that and it's like okay hey get your stuff together man we're with you yes you know and it's and so let's hope that that's that's the course that it takes and that Ja can look back at this and say, you know what? Um, I dodged something pretty serious right there. Yes. I was, I was playing with fire there and I, and, and I didn't, I, got, I didn't to get totally burned up. Exactly. Yes, exactly. So man, Ja, uh, I don't know you. Uh, I wish you nothing but the best man. The one thing about being rich and famous, it ain't easy. It ain't easy. I know everybody think it's easy because everything you do is on TV. Everybody talks about you. Oh, everybody he must have it great. Oh, look yes. at all the money. You know. Yeah, and, but no. you got to have people around you, man, who tell you no. See, the reason a lot of child, they call it child actors. The reason child actors fail is not because they're child actors. It's because everybody around them is on the payroll and they never tell them no. It's the same thing when you're rich and famous. Like, they all on your private jet. 
Oh. Hey, last thing you're going to do is say no and then you yes. cut out the will. Yep, that's exactly no right. You're buying all the dinners. You're buying all the drinks. You all go out on vacation having fun. So the people around you are never going to tell you no. But that's the problem. You got to have people around you says, no, you don't need to do that. Like my bodyguard, James, he's a big old dude. He'll say to me sometime, Chuck, you've had too much to drink. Let's go. I'm like, I'm ha- Chuck, I'm going ha- to tell you this one more time. Let's go. And the first, he's been with me almost 30 years now. In the beginning, I used to fight him. You talk about your good dudes. Yeah, too. yeah, he's a great and, dude. And, and, and you know what? And the reason that when he says it's time to go, you go is because of the respect you do have for yes. him. And for the fact that here's the clear thinking guy right now yes. saying, this is the better plan, yeah, Chuck. Because he, he never drinks. He's like, mate, my job is to protect you. Because he was a cop for 35 years. Yeah. His wife, Denise, was a cop for 35 years. He'll say to me, hey, let's go. I do. We just got here. He says, "Let's go," and he'll explain to me when we get outside. He says, "He says, he says, look at those dudes over there before we go." And I said, what, "What's up with those dudes?" He says, "The only reason you're wearing coats in a nightclub is you got guns," and I was like, "Oh, okay, good point," and we'll leave. Uh, but man, I just hope this thing turns out. So now uh, on to a let's have some fun now because this is what the uh, podcast is for. O.J. Simpson. Excuse me? O.J. Simpson, as the kids say, shaking my head. O.J. put out a video. They comment on the Murdoch murders. And I'm saying to myself, are you serious right now? He put out like a a, a serious video, Ernie, commenting. Chuck, saying, I haven't seen this. Oh, you got to go see it, Ernie. He, cause it's, and this is legit. This is legit. He's discussing the Murdoch murders, and he says, well, people wanted my opinion. No, we didn't. We didn't want your opinion. OJ, stand down. Shut the f*** up. Stand <laughs> down. Don't come in on a double murder because you got away with it. I, I, I was When I sit there, my friend said, yo, man, do you know OJ? I said, no, oh, I never met OJ. He said, you got to watch this video. And he's commenting on a, on a, on a double murder, Ernie. You got to make sure you go look at it. I mean, because it's like, are you serious right now? I'll do it right after this podcast, (laughs) which will continue with Jay Wright right after this. Back here on the steam room, Ernie Johnson and Charles Barkley. Ernie. We are getting ready. Ernie, this is going to be so much fun for me. I met Jay Wright Mm -hmm. in 1984, 85, when he was like a grad assistant at Villanova. That's how long we've been together. Wow, that has been a while. It, it has. I've known him since 1984, 85, my first year in the NBA. He was a nobody back then. And now here you are. Um, I'm a teammates, has-been. Teammates in the Naismith Hall of Fame. Yes. Uh, and, and Jay Wright, two-time national championship coach at Villanova, and now uh, a member of the uh, CBS uh, sports family and working with us yes. during March Madness as well. So Jay Wright, welcome to the program. We have uh, uh, we have only one rule in the steam room, and that is uh, leave your towel on. <laughs> it is great to be in the steam room, man. Very cool. You've been a basketball coach forever. This is your first year of retirement. What what has been the most interesting thing about being retired? retired you know one of the things i've found out that we we had this saying when we were coaching and playing we had this term we use called 94 by 50 feet which was you just keep your focus on 94 by 50 feet don't uh whether we're playing on the road don't get caught up in the crowd if we're playing at home don't get caught up with your friends and family there and as I've gone around to these different places now to do games, um, I realized that I did a really good job of that because like we we do a game at Kansas and, you know, people from CBS are asking me, like, where did you stay when you played Kansas? Like, what restaurant did you go to? I don't remember anything except the game. Like, I'm watching the the fans and the cheerleaders and the, the band. And, like, I, I missed out on all of that. I'm loving just all of the – the pomp and circumstance to go around the game and being in the college towns, 
going out with Raph the night before the game. I'm loving all of that. I never, I, I never got to experience that. So what do you, and well, I guess in the course of the season, what were the moments where you thought I have to fight off this urge or this feeling that I miss this, that I, you know, I, I wish I were still in it. I, I swear, Ernie, I, I feel so blessed that for whatever reason, I don't know how this worked out, but I really feel like I've been blessed that I just knew it was time to get out and I really don't miss it. I, I, I got to admit once in a while you're standing on the court, you know, you do the, the open before the game, you're standing on the court and they're doing the national anthem and the place, you know, right before that is rocking. And the, you get a little, I remember doing a game at Purdue. It was so loud. We couldn't hear in our headsets. There's a little second there. You're like, this is cool, man. This, this juice is cool. But then as soon as the game starts and I look across and see the faces of the coaches, the agony, I'm like, <laughs> I'm so glad. I'm so glad I'm out of this, man. I'm so glad I'm on the other side. I really don't miss it at all. I I, I, I enjoyed every second of it. There was never a time when I thought, I don't like this. I I, I feel like I got everything out of it, and I'm, I'm enjoying this new life. So I, I remember sitting on the set when it came across the blurb that J. Rice retired, and my phone starts going crazy. Like, is this true? Is this true? I'm like, I just got to think, because we were on the air that night when it came over. So I've known you forever. I've known Patty forever. You don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to retire. You don't do that. When did you first talk to Patty about, like, hey, this is what I'm thinking. What do you think? How how much in advance did you think about retiring before you actually got the words out? You know, it, it started to hit me. We, we were in Tokyo for the Olympics, and it was the craziest. That Olympics, like nobody talks about it because nobody was there. And it, it was a mess in the beginning with guys getting hurt and getting COVID and us losing exhibition games. But – like we were quarantined in a hotel in Tokyo. We couldn't go outside. It was just us and the women's team. And there was times like I'd be in my room. I was thinking like, you know, I'm waking up at two in the morning in Tokyo to call back to call recruits. And I started thinking like, I might, I might had enough of this. I just started thinking about it. Then we got home and then our, we got home in September. Then it was the hall of fame. And you were the best Charles for coming with me, man. And, standing up there with me. I really appreciate it. And then the season started. And, and then I, I started saying to Patty then, like, right after the Hall of Fame, like, I, you know what? I might, this might be it, man. I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm just tired. Like, I, I don't, I don't see getting through this season. And then maybe like in, in December, I started saying, we started saying, like, this is it. Like, I got, I got to, the, the season was getting very difficult. I was like, I just got to fight through this season and finish this. And knowing that it was going to be my last season gave me the energy to fight through it. But I really felt like I fought through that last year. And, and that's why I think I've been at, at, at peace with it. I, I really, I really don't, I don't miss it, but that was about, I'd say about January, Patty and I both said like, all right, this, this is going to be, this is going to be it. So you've been at home every day. Is she sick of you yet? <laughs> <laughs> No, best thing is, man, she plays tennis. Like I'm I'm home preparing for games, like or or we go down to Florida sometimes. I'm playing, I'm preparing for games. She's out playing in member member golf tournaments and stuff. She's living the life I wanted to live, man. <laughs> I don't know how I screwed this up. <laughs> that is so awesome. So how big a contributing factor into and I saw you quoted as saying you it kind of lost the edge for for doing this, but the transfer portal. NIL, and and it's kind of a two-part question. How big were those factors? And is it conceivable, Jay, that you're just saying, you know what, I need some time away from this, and some, and I will, I can see myself getting back into it. You know what, Ernie? It it was not really. I I think if um, I think this NIL and transfer portal thing is just 
an evolution of college basketball. Like we, our generation, the three of us, you know, we lived in the old days when the coach was the king and was the teacher and you went to college for your education and to play. It's just changed. And I think it's a good thing. I think it's good. I think the game is as, as good as it's ever been. It's just different for people of our generation. So it it really wasn't that. It was and and Charles, you know what Villanova's like. It's it's bigger than just basketball. It's it's taking on the responsibility of everyone graduating. Um, just like you were talking about with John Morant, just the, the responsibility of teaching these young guys that it's not about you. It's 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 you're representing your family, you're representing Villanova basketball, you're representing Villanova University. I took such great pride in that. And it was in a sense, exhausting. It wasn't just the basketball. It was, it was how our guys represented everybody graduating on time, everybody buying into our culture, you know, staying in touch with the guys when they go to the NBA and still stay hungry and humble. Like that responsibility, I really took seriously and I loved it. I didn't feel I had the energy to keep that going. And I didn't want to do it at 70%. Even when I told our athletic director and our president, they said to, they said to me, look, you know, you at 70% is, is good for us. We're good with that. You know, take some time. Don't, you know, delegate some things. I, I didn't want to do it that way. I really didn't. I just didn't want that responsibility anymore. And we had some young assistants, Kyle Neptune being one of them, that I knew would be really good at it. And I didn't want to hand it over to somebody when it was a mess, mm -hmm. even though I gave them a whole injured team. I didn't know that at the time. <laughs> but but I knew we had a good time to hand it over to a great young guy that would take that same responsibility that I did. And so I kind of put that all together. It it really wasn't the transfer portal, even though that is challenging. It really wasn't that and and NIL. So let's get to basketball now. Hold it. He didn't answer the second part of the question. Is the door open for more coaching in your future? No, I, I really, I really think I'm, I'm done. I, you know, I, I know enough about life, not a lot, but enough about it to know that things change. But my, in my heart right now, I'm such at peace with this. Um, I, I'm, you know, I like living in the area where we live. Um, I, I, I like still being connected to Villanova. I'm assistant with to the president. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of Kyle Neptune. I think he's in a great spot. I think the program's in a good spot, even though we had a crazy year because of injuries. But um, I really like where I am, and um, I, I just don't I don't have that 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 drive to to coach a team and lead a team. Gotcha. So, who are the five in your opinion? Who are the five best teams in the country going into March Madness? Um, I, I like Alabama a lot. I got to do their last game, even though they lost it. I like them a lot. I like UCLA, although they lost, they just lost a really important player, their best defensive player, uh, Jalen Clark. And I got to see them play in the, in the PAC 12 tournament to see how that affects them. Cause it could affect them. Um, I like Houston. I, I think. Houston will get to the Final Four. If I had to pick today, I would pick them. And I like Purdue. Um, I think Purdue is it, it, having gone through these losses and everything will actually help them in the tournament. And uh, if you pick the sleeper, a team that I, I can't get out of my head that I went to watch, TCU at Kansas. We did that game. And I, they blew out Kansas at Kansas. I can't. I can't get that vision out of my head. It was unbelievable. They were, they were so, they were so explosive, and, and now they get everybody healthy. They they could surprise some people. Yeah, I said, and they use it in us. They use it in their introductions, which pisses me off. Alabama. I said <laughs> I was doing a radio. Oh, yeah. yeah, I was doing a radio show in Alabama like three months ago, and I says I just started watching college basketball. The best team in the country is Alabama. And a, a couple of my friends, <laughs> and a couple of my friends called me. They're like, "Yo, man, they're using you like in the introduction to the game." They teach you to keep your mouth shut, hey, man. Hey, you know, hey, listen. <laughs> I, and I said, and I said, I actually they left out the part I said before. I said, and this really pains me to say this, but I'm, <laughs> I, I just started getting ready for March Madness, 
And the best team I saw so far is Alabama. And they got the best player in the country. But, you know, and Jay just said it. My, my question is with Alabama, is the, the Miller situation going to be so much of a distraction? Are they going to be able to pull it together? That's my only question. Like, I do agree. I think Houston is definitely going to the Final Four because I said they were the second best team. But I wonder about the Alabama situation because they have one good advantage. And then, because their first games are in Birmingham. So it won't be a hostile environment for that kid. But as soon as they play away from Alabama, we know how college kids and fans are. They're going to give the kid a hard time. He's going to get some home cooking in the beginning because, you know, Alabama, they're going to cheer for him in Birmingham. But I wonder about the distraction going forward. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, and, and Charles, you, I don't know if you've seen that thing, but in watching film of Alabama, it's, their introductions of the game started the whole day of music and everything, and then they <laughs> shut everything down. And then it says, and then it comes on your voice in the arena saying, Alabama is the best basketball <laughs> team in the country. And then everything goes. That's how it starts. I don't know how anybody could watch the rest of it. The place is probably roaring just here in the Chuckster, extolling the virtues of the Crimson Tide. <laughs> Remember last year when, when the Rock 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 was giving me a hard time because I picked Alabama to go to the Final Four. He sounded a tweak. He says, "This is a sad day for me." My Auburn brother said, "Roll Tide yeah. on television." <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I was thinking to myself, I can't believe he did this for them. Now, it makes more sense how you explained it. But anyway, to talk about that team and having the experience of coaching 18 to 22-year-olds, I think Brandon Miller, he's got a little bit of you in him, Chuck. Like he he kind of takes on that that adversity from the crowd. It it, it kind of inspires him. And like the, his, the game he had against South Carolina right after that was incredible. Incredible. But – I do think for a program and a team being around college kids and knowing what you have to deal with as a coach off the court, dealing with media, dealing with families that are affected by this and, and, and the, the enormity of this situation, you know, a, a, a young, a young lady's life was taken. The, the grief that that I know is putting on everybody. I think over the over time in the tournament that could wear them out. It, it really, it really could. You, you don't see what goes on behind the scenes because when those kids step on the court, they're tough minded. They're competitors. That's kind of their piece is when they're on the court. But all the other time, answering questions about that all the time, and and dealing with those issues, I think could wear them out. Hey, let's. I want to get into into your mindset and, and into uh, how you go about that job going into March Madness when, Jay, you might have a team that you feel this is championship material. Or you might feel, you know, if we get to the Sweet 16, it'd be a miracle. You know, but these are things that you in your private moments are thinking. How do you relay expectations to your team going into the tournament? We would specifically never talk about it. Never, ever talk about it. And we always focus on the next game. We That we would talk about all the time. Let's, let's continue to get better next game. Because, for instance, right now, the Big East tournament's going on. You'd be in the Big East tournament. You wouldn't even think about the NSA tournament. And what's funny is I did the, um, the reveal show for CBS that, you know, where they put the 16 t- top seeds up. I never saw that show ever. (laughs) I'm telling these guys, like they got me on set. Like, well, you remember that? I'm like, no, I never watched this show because I didn't, if we were a one seed or I didn't want our guys talking about it, thinking about it and, or thinking that we had already accomplished something, you know, you, we have, it's kind of what you were talking about. John Morant, Charles, like, you know, these are college kids and there's so much stuff coming at them all the time. We would always, have the philosophy dominate their time, which means the more time we could spend with our guys and talk to them about next day, yeah, get better each day, 
next game, if we could be around them a lot and they were hearing that, let's say 60% of their waking hours, then 40% of their waking hours, they were hearing you're a one seed. You can win the national championship. You can win this. You can get to the sweet 16. We just tried to dominate that thinking and say next game only. You were just in 94 by 50 uh, mode, man. That's that's all you were. Yeah. It's like, oh, I had no idea yeah. all this stuff went into this. All right. <laughs> exactly. Hey, I got to tell you this. I got to tell you this. So I'm going to do the selection show on Sunday. Yeah. I have never watched a complete selection <laughs> show ever. <laughs> because it, you know, you're sitting there, you got all these people around you, your president's there, the dean of the business school's there, you got parents of players there, you got alumni. So you're talking to everybody. And then as soon as your team gets picked, all the local media is there. So then you go, you don't watch the rest of the show. You know, I've, I've never seen that entire show ever. That's funny. So I'm looking forward to it. So I always tell people, because everybody's like, I, I says, I really can find out who can really coach the second game. Because the first game, you get basically a week to prepare. And I says, I really find out who can coach the second game because now you only got a day in between and you 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 assume, especially when there's an upset. I said, yeah, you, yeah, of course you have your game plan. You find out who you're playing Sunday. You're going to play either Thursday or Friday. So, yeah, that's plenty of time for coaching strategy. But when you only have a day in between games, was that the hardest thing for you, Jay? It, you know, it was, Charles. And we we actually lost a couple times in the second round. And to, to your point, that, that's it is a really good point. What we try to do is is try to figure out, look, especially when you're like a one seed and you're playing a 16 seed, you have to keep your guys focused on the next game. Because you can't say all year, next game, next game. We would look at it like it's a two-game tournament. And we would tell the players, if we win this two-game tournament, then we'll come back and we'll figure out the next tournament we're in. But we got to concentrate on the first game. And we say to the guys, myself, the head coach, and the players, we're all going to focus on this 16 seed. We'll have our assistants will be looking at the next game. Nobody else worry about the second game. But what we would secretly try to do is find things that the other two teams did that were similar to that 16 seed. So when we practiced, we were really preparing for all three teams. And then after that first game, we would say, okay, similar to this 16 team, we have worked on this this week. These are the things that the next team will do. And I, I got a good story for one year, and we screwed this up. I learned a lesson. We were the number one seed. We were playing in Pittsburgh, and LSU played – against NC State. They were the 8-9. And at, we we played Lafayette in the first round, and we played outstanding, one by 40. And then we all watched LSU play NC State. And NC State was horrible, terrible. They were down 10 with like a minute 30 to go, and they just started fouling LSU. And LSU missed every free throw. <laughs> and then NC State won the game. But our guys couldn't get out of their mind how bad NC State looked the whole game. <laughs> we didn't take – I don't think – as much as we tried, we didn't take NC State serious. We wound up getting beat in the second round. by And they played great against us. But my point being, I never watched the game again with our team after the first round. I only took the highlights of the team that won so they wouldn't see the bad part. Hey – uh Okay, that's a lot. Chuck, enough basketball talk for you at this point. Yes. Okay. I want to. I want to go back to when you guys were hanging out uh, in the in the mid eighties. Yes. Uh, I miss those days. Man. Yeah. Oh, well, what do you miss the most? What can you share, Jay? That won't get you in trouble. <laughs> Ernie, as you know him, there's as you know him, there's limited parts of that you could share. But <laughs> first of all, he he was a couple years into the NBA. It's crazy as he is. He, he was crazier back then. But I tell you what, I, don't, I, I share this with people. I never get to say it on air. The most generous, nicest guy you ever met. Like, I, I can't tell some of the stories. Like, there are friends of ours that we hung out with. We were like, we were like 24 years old, 
there were friends of ours that got married that he paid for the wedding and no one knows except me, them, and him. He did all kinds of things like that. He would go see kids in hospital. So that's why crazy as he is, we all love him. But we used to hang out at this this bar called Al E. Gators. Alligators. <laughs> that was our spot. And I was actually there when he met Maureen, who I went to high school with that night. Wow. And, and let me tell you something. Jay really pissed me off one day because, so <laughs> we practiced at St. Joe's. I'm friends with all the Villanova guys. And obviously, Jay, obviously, but I'm friends because they're they're right to basically together. St. Joe, they're like the bitter rivals. So I wanted my daughter to go to St. Joe's. So I took her on a visit. <laughs> I took her on a visit to St. Joe's. And Jay takes my daughter on a visit to Villanova. And I got outvoted uh, two to one. And uh, I was, I'm still mad to this day, but my daughter loved Villanova and one of the reasons I love Jay, Jay gave, uh, he, he says, he told the basketball team, Charles' daughter is off limits to you guys. <laughs> so we, he's like, he says, I was like, oh, Jay, Jay, we're good now. I forgive you for her not going to St. Joe's. But man, she loved Villanova. She got some of the greatest friends. And the only time she ever made me mad. So she calls me uh, when Jay wins his first national championship. So she calls me. She says, Dad, can I get tickets to the Final Four? I said, of course you can. No problem. She calls me back the next day. She says, Dad, I changed my mind. I says, why you change your mind? She says, I don't want to jinx the team. I says, so I paid all that money mm -hmm. for you to go to Villanova, <laughs> and you think whether you go to the game or not is going to dictate whether they win or lose. I said, I could have sent your ass to community college if you're going <laughs> to you know, say. But so she stayed. She, she was in New York at the time, so she went to a Villanova bar. But she came down for the second national championship. She said, Dad, this is one of the coolest things of my life. Hey, Jay, before, before, we, let you, before we let you go, um, and we appreciate uh, the, the generosity with, uh, with your time today. He had nothing else to do today. <laughs> I'm not working anymore. Uh, but aside from your professional exploits, uh, you should know, and Charles is probably too bashful to say this, um, you rank right up there with Tom Brady in his book. Yeah, uh, he, he's like, I, I said, because I said, we, we were saying we got Jay on. I said, he's not quite Tom Brady, but he's a good looking man. <laughs> I said, like Tom Brady's a Tom Brady's a pretty man. Yeah. Would you look Jay directly in the eyes, <laughs> no, can, which no, is something no, me, you won't me, do hey, with Tom hey, Brady? Hey, listen, I can look Jay in the eyes. When I look Tom Brady in the eyes, I don't. It's just everything after "Hey Tom" is just gibberish. I, I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> hey Ernie, my one, I got, one of the, my favorites. All I got to tell you is, we we used to do these clinics in Puerto Rico where uh, these camps where we would bring our wife. Well, we, we weren't even married then. We'd bring our girlfriends. It was Patty and Maureen. We'd go with Roly Massimino. And Charles, Roly, Patty, Mar they they would all party. They'd go to the beach all day. I'd run the camp from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. <laughs> Charles would come for one hour, one hour in five days. I'd work all day. They're all go they'd go out at night. I'd be in the room doing the schedules for the next day. They'd come in partying all night, waking me up. They they all had the greatest time. I worked my butt off for a week. That was that was my uh, Charles Barkley memory of coaching together. Well, you know what? Uh, I'm so glad you brought up Coach Mass because <laughs> one of the craziest, greatest people I've ever met in my life. Can you, before we let you go, can you tell us what Coach Massimino means to you? He was he was really like a, a godfather. He really was. He 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 would ask us to do anything for him, and we'd work our butt off. But he would he would do anything for you, and and for his whole life. And he expected you to come to him if you needed anything, you needed help. And I, I would leave with my my last coach Massimino story. When he hired me, our whole staff was a time. You remember Charles? We had we had um, John Olive, Steve Pannone. Tom Massimino, everybody was Italian. 
So we'd go to restaurants all the time and he would say, this is my whole staff. They're all Italian. Everybody's Italian. We'd always be at an Italian restaurant. <laughs> After like the second month, I was like, <laughs> coach, you realize I'm not Italian, right? He goes, you're not. I said, no. He said, why didn't you tell me you weren't Italian? I said, you, ne- you never asked me. He goes, I would have never hired you if you weren't Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ever tell anybody you're not Italian. So I did, when he passed away, I did his eulogy. It was the first time I could say a lot. I said, I could now admit I'm not Italian. <laughs> but I never would say that to anybody the whole time I worked for him. Jay Wright, man, we look forward to working with you as the as the madness begins next week on CBS, TBS, TNT, and True TV. Oh, yeah. And uh, looking forward to it. Thanks a bunch. Great to be with you guys. Look forward to working with you. Yes, sir. He believe we've been together since 1985. And he's been the same. No matter how much success he's had, he's always been the same guy. When he went, uh, I think, I forget where he was at first before he came back to Villanova, Hofstra, he's still been the same guy. This next segment guaranteed to be legendary (laughs) because it features the legendary longtime producer of Inside the NBA, Tim Kiley. We call him TK. You can too. Yeah, we call him TK, not legendary. That's my point. Hey, legendary TK. Hey, iconic TK. I'm ready to be legendary and iconic because I had a nip or two of Chuck's Redmond before I came on. Oh, I like it. So I'm just just want to make sure you're all right. All you want, all you want, brother. All so right. you just dipped into that big bucket yeah, of it yeah. that we've got in the green room? <laughs> just walk by. As, as a ladle. Like, exactly. Hey, and a bunch of like Dixie a, cups. That's exactly, exactly right. The red solo cups. <laughs> just walk by. Little espresso <laughs> cups. <laughs> just, you know. Just dip your hand in there with one of those uh, solo cups. Hey, just just, just put your mouth in there. <laughs> don't, don't worry about a cup. Just a, There's one big straw <laughs> so, shared by everyone. Yeah, it's beautiful. One of the questions you guys get asked the most, I guarantee you, is chemistry. Yes. Right? Why the show works so well because of chemistry. I have in my hand the actual research and reason that you guys have such chemistry. Uh Uh-oh, this is going to be good. Where did did this come from? uh, Chuck, you're born February 20th. Yep. Shaq, March 6th. Yep. Kenny, March 8th. Yep. And Ernie is August 7th. Okay. Right? Mm-hmm. All three of you guys are Pisces. Yes. And Ernie is a four Leo. four guys. Okay. I'm a Leo, yeah. You're a Leo. Le- Leos are full of life, mm-hmm. confident, mm-hmm. optimistic. Mm-hmm. But when you're having a bad day, you're narcissistic, you're domineering, mm-hmm. and you're greedy. Mm-hmm. I just mm-hmm. want to make sure... <laughs> Never had a bad day. <laughs> hey, wait. This- Leo should partner with a Sagittarius, an Aries, or Libra. Do you know what? Uh, I have no Cheryl idea Ann? what Cheryl Ann's. What's her birthday? Uh, uh, April 13th. April 13th. She is an Aries. And that's, and that's so. That's, they, they match? Yeah, they match. Wow. They match perfectly. Leo should, should partner with an Aries. So what's the, uh, what's the Pisces? All right, Pisces, this is all three of you jokers, right? Because you're all born so close together. You're compassionate. Yep. You're emotional. Check. You're artistic. (laughs) Uh, (laughs) Pisces bad. You're gloomy, self-pitying. That's Kenny and Shaq. And easy to take advantage of. That's definitely Kenny. (laughs) That's definitely Kenny. And Pisces should partner with Cancer the Crab, a Taurus, or a Virgo. When was Maureen born? Uh, January. January, that's it? Yep, 14th. She's a Capricorn. So there you go. How about you, Dingus? When were you born? What sign are you? What are your uh, qualities? Well, hold on a second. I got I to gotta give you your horoscope, Bernie, for oh. today. Uh-oh. You ready for You're today? Li- you ready for today? Just relax at home. You'll get, yeah, you'll that's going to happen. You'll get what you need for the day. Yeah. Your lucky color today. <laughs> They're forgetting we have a double header tonight, so I'll just be relaxing. <laughs> well, I didn't say any of this was accurate. I just yeah. said What's his lucky color? Lucky color is black. We all know the Godfather's black, yep. right? So there you go. We're all black friends. It's, that's right. And what else is in your uh, horoscope today? Oh, uh, and something auspicious will happen to you 
between the four and five o'clock hour. That's when our production meeting is. I don't even know what auspicious means. Notable. <laughs> notable. Just notable. Huge. Notable. Okay. Yeah. Notable. Oh, I'm well, a well, Shaq, You're going to see Shaq. He's huge. I'm not going to see Shaq at four o'clock. That's no, for no sure. Way. Oh, yeah. I'm a Taurus. I'm a fat ass bull. Well, th- that's the first thing you said that was correct. All Named right. after a Ford sedan. And- <laughs> <laughs> Chuck, your horoscope today, just the final one. Your gracious, tender nature is much appreciated today. Oh, thank you. Appreciate it. You may feel your head is so far up in the clouds that you can't get anything done. Trust that you have built a strong foundation which allows you to work in the clouds. Make time today for romance and save your money. I'm at work, TK. That's out the door. (laughs) It's just, it should be like, just got to work all day. Chuck's on TV from 7 o'clock to 2 in the morning. All right, well, we well, tried. Thank you, thank you for the try, though. We, we tried. We tried, Ernie. It fell flatter than a pancake. What do you mean, we tried? I tried. <laughs> you tried. I tried. But yeah, I got something else for you. Uh-oh. I got a phone call. You asked for international phone calls. Okay. Go ahead, Cap. Roll it. Hello, world. This is Charles Barkley. Leave me a message. Hello. This is Yongja calling from Seoul, Korea. I'm a big fan. Something that a lot of people don't know is that during Mr. Barkley's early tenure on TNT, you guys tried a couple of different talk show formats. One of them was the talk show called Listen Up with Charles Barkley. Another one was called Thursday Night Theater, where you guys introduced a movie being shown on TNT that night. I'm curious, what do you think has changed between now and then? Why has the steam room been such a big success compared to Thursday Night Theater and Listen Up? Thank you for your time. Well, first of all, to steal your line, Thursday Night Theater was not really a show as much as it was little cut-ins into a movie that was on TNT. Which was awesome. And it was fun because we would just crack on the movie. Yeah. 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 Uh, In terms of why Listen Up only lasted one year, um, it wasn't my fault. I promise you. No, I um, think I think it wasn't you. You weren't the you weren't the producer of that show. Yeah, the the Steve Becker did that show. Well, I think that. One of the problems was they started trying to make it too, like, formal. Like, they like, well, we have a movie coming out. Let's have the movie start. Like, yo, man, we're just trying to have fun for a couple of minutes. And I, I think that was the problem with Listen Up. Yeah, if, if we had just, if we could have put the steam room on TV. Yes, you know? absolutely. Yes. If we did this show on TV, I think it'd yeah. be. And, I think and, it would be much more than one year, maybe two seasons. And yeah. memorable <laughs> moments, memorable moments. Yeah, you had Charles kissing the ass of the donkey with Jesse Ventura. Jesse in the, the body. Uh, shout Ventura. out to Jesse yeah. Ventura. He was oh, yeah. he was in the this, studio yeah. that night. And Sir Charles Theater gave us John Wayne, which and was take that with you. Wait, hold on. It was a scene where the posse rolled up. On John Wayne and his posse rolled up, and you made us stop the tape and said, that's why John Wayne's my man, because look in the back, way in the back of the posse was a black guy on a horse. There was only one black guy. Like There's like one black guy in every, like in one out of 10 Western movies, there was one black guy. And he was always That's in why the John back. Wayne was your man. I, I like. I, I was a big John Wayne fan. Um, and Ernie asked you to imitate him. I said, Pew, and take that with you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you had the six shooters. Give me your best John Wayne. Pew, pew. Uh, That's not a good John Wayne. Uh, well, the sons of Katie Elder. Great uh, movie. True Grit. Mm-hmm. Those are two great. The sons of Katie Elder, I can remember that one. That, uh, but uh, True Grit, I'm trying to think. That's pretty much the only two I can remember off the top of my head. Thanks hey. for taking us down that road. Yeah, That's it. So, uh, oh, we do have one more thing. Uh-oh. Oh, the music. <laughs> oh, Saturday Night Live feel to that. Oh, wow. wow. Don't you remember that? I can't believe that show was successful. That was pretty awesome. Right that was there. a nice. We had little, some great was... star guest stars on that show. Yeah. George Clooney. Uh, that we... was, that was impressive right there. Yeah. Remember when we had uh, Robert Randolph and the Family Band in the studio oh, yeah. and they were playing the we had playing Kevin, the slide. Yeah. Kevin Spacey. Yeah. What's the guy's name? Uh, oh God, not Christopher Walken, but 
Oh, John, John Boyd. Boyd. John, John Boyd, Boyd was, was tremendous. He was he tremendous. Was tremendous. Yes. But man, I I forgot about that opening. That was amazing. <laughs> Shout out to whoever did that opening. That yeah. was pretty awesome. Yeah. Too bad we only saw it for one season. That's it. One glorious season, Chuck Stewart. Can't believe it went successful. Yeah. That, Leave hey. them wanting more, Ernie. Yeah. That's what you you know. Our philosophy's always been exactly. We have we have more phone calls still to come. Yes. Uh, Chuck's answering machine coming up. Thank you, shortly. Legend. On, uh, uh, you know, it, on the steam room. This one was a pancake, but I'll take it. Remember when Aretha Franklin was on and <laughs> we tried to get her to sing yeah. something just no. for a couple of seconds? She said, like, nope. Nope. That was happy <laughs> birthday. She did, she did come on and wish me a happy birthday. Yeah. <laughs> Chuck and Ernie in steam room. Come and join us in steam room. Chuck and Ernie in steam room. Leave your towel on in steam room. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to the Steam Room. If you're uh, new to the podcast, and we certainly welcome newcomers, although we the hell really been, appreciate uh, the loyal new, steamers. Where the hell y'all been? Yeah, well, it's a good question. We always uh, finish it up with a segment uh, which features uh, Chuck's answering machine, where we take calls from all over the world. 404-987-0330. And with whatever's on your mind. I love it when we get the international calls. Well, let's go. Hey, Ernie and Chuck. Uh, my name is Matan. I'm an 18-year-old from Atlanta, Georgia. Not too far from Studio J, actually. I was applying to colleges early in the year, and one of them asked me what class I thought everyone at their school should take. And without hesitating, I said it should be a course called Inside the MBA, an analysis of television's finest spectacle. I'm constantly in awe of how you manage to blend serious reflections and contemporary issues with laugh out loud jokes and pranks. And sometimes when you get to it, even basketball. And the Steam Room podcast is just as great. Uh, with all that said, I wanted to ask you, Ernie, what prompted you to make EJ's Nito Stab the Night unsullied by sponsorship? I think it's really commendable to have a segment of a nationally televised show that's pure and not swayed by corporate influence. I've always wanted to know the full story behind it. Thank you both for everything. Okay, here's the... <laughs> appreciate the call. Here's the whole story. The whole story behind... Uh, the neato stat of the night was uh, years and years ago, right after uh, the Chuckster started, um, I would refer to something as neat, and 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 Chuck would just crush me for it. <laughs> Nobody says neat. Nobody. And then and then you heard Tiger say something was neat, and all of a sudden it was okay to say neat. Yeah, because y'all two nerds. Yeah, yeah. Okay, You're Tiger so and nerd. So then we it just morphed into okay. Here should be a neat stat of the night, and then it was just like, hey, that's neato. So here's the neato stat of the night. Uh, unsullied by sponsorship really is just a result of the fact that they could never sell it. And so <laughs> right. I took the other side and said, eh, no, it's uh, I'm unsullied by sponsorship. But since 1989. Since 1989. Uh, but occasionally, yes. you know, it will be sponsored. Uh, but I gain, I gain nothing out of it. So yeah. I'm still unsullied by sponsorship. It's not like, hey, it's sponsored tonight by so-and-so, and all of a sudden I'm getting a lot of stuff. So I remain unsullied and thanks for being a law steamer and from atlanta georgia thanks for being a law steamer next call hey chuck this is sunday from new york city i'm a huge fan and a loyal steamer i had the privilege of meeting you at the live golf tournament last summer in new jersey you were so gracious and kind to take a picture with me you really made my day there's something that's been bothering me for a while that i wanted to get your thoughts on i've been pretty fortunate to do well financially in the investment business in the past few years. And I feel like every time I go out with, with friends recently, everyone expects me to pick up the tab. It just gets <laughs> annoying after a while. I'm not on your level by any means, but how have you dealt with the freeloaders over the years? Thanks, guys. Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, you have to learn the magic word, no, uh, because you need to pay attention to what everybody's ordering. Because I figured out who my really good friends are. Number one, a good friend pay the check sometimes. But also, you can tell if they're taking advantage of you by what they're ordering. If they're ordering the most expensive thing on the menu, if they're ordering the most expensive alcohol, you got some bombs at your life, brother. You need to get rid of them. But a good friend always wants to pay the check sometime. Those are friends. Sound like you got some freeloaders, but 
always check what they're ordering. That's how you can tell who's full of shit or not. Because if they're ordering the most expensive steak or they're getting the best wine or best alcohol that they couldn't afford if they were buying for themselves, you need to you need to say, no, no, you, you're going to pay tonight because they're ordering the best stuff on your dime. You need to get rid of them, brother. <laughs> Hope you can take that advice to heart. Next. Hey, Chuck and Ernie. My name's Ray. My pronouns are they, them. I'm calling you from Kansas City. I've wanted to tell you what a time capsule the steam room is. Um, I'm a loyal steamer, but to be completely honest, it's only been this past uh, past year. I am new uh, to being a fan of basketball, and uh, I can't even tell you how much joy it's brought me and things to think about and uh, my own, let's say, Blackberry moments. <laughs> um, I'm a therapist, and for 23 years I was a sign language interpreter. I uh, did a lot of mental health, behavioral health, and medical work and decided it was time to go into private practice for myself. So that's where I find myself. And I tell you all this because not only do I want to thank you um, as I sit here wearing my low-chi bracelet, but I have a request. I would respectfully and humbly request that you mail me one of those uh, rubber duckies that you dumped on Chuck's head during Inside. <laughs> I want to put it in my office, my therapy office. And when people ask me about this rubber ducky, I will tell them where it came from. Um, who knows? Maybe it'll even still uh, smell like Diet Pepsi. Ernie and Chuck, uh, <laughs> I can't thank you enough. Oh, that was awesome. So here you go. Cap assures me that he will, that they are in the mail to Ray, as that a matter awesome. of fact. Well, yeah. number one, congratulations to the Kansas City Chiefs, uh, uh, world champions. Another one. Shout out to my boy Travis Kelsey, who. Did a hell of a job on SNL. Uh, on SNL, which is the longest week of your life. I haven't talked to him since. I want to know because that I talked to JJ Watt about. It. I said, "Man, that's a hard week. It's a it's amazing and special." But I got to talk to Travis and see how that goes. Shout out for being a, a psychiatrist, right? Uh, counselor, counselors, yeah. yeah, working with people because uh, you know we talked about it uh, last week. I think, man, everybody got some stuff going on. No matter no matter who you are. Everybody has stuff going on, and we need people like yourself, Ray, that people can talk to. So thank you for what you do. And hopefully those uh, rubber duckies will uh, will come in handy for yes. you. Yes. That'll be a good – that's a good office piece. That's like, yeah. Hey, what? we don't know when we'll uh, be back with you, but we will be here on the steam room. Uh, Probably three weeks. We offer yeah, three weeks, Somewhere right? around that. And, and during the NBA playoffs – Occasionally, we'll we'll look and see where the schedule works and that kind of thing. But uh, you haven't heard the last of us. No, we off for three weeks, yeah. uh, two weeks in New York and one week uh, one weekend in Houston. Looking forward to going back to Houston. I, I I don't think I've been there since I retired. Maybe I don't think so. You've but been I, there since we've had the Final Four there. Okay, that's the last time I've been there. It is. Okay, hey, listen, I don't keep up with the Final Four. Uh, I, like I don't, I don't remember you, uh, where all of them are. But what do you mean? You just said, "Hey, the final four. You've got to be there. It's the greatest weekend in sports. You got to be there." And it you, is, and you were there in Houston. Okay, I don't. I didn't remember. I don't remember. <laughs> where, I've been to twelve apparently. Or uh, ten. You said we've been to ten or eleven. Remember, folks, go to the final four. It's memorable. No, just ask the, Chuck. The, no, not the cities. The the event itself. Oh, okay. okay. I got the you. event itself. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks for clarifying. Okay. And thank you for listening. Uh, to the steam room. Thank you, guys. We'll see you soon. <laughs>